There's a good chunk of us present, so I think we'll get started now. But I've got a few quick announcements before we go. Uh, so, uh, this will this will mostly be scheduling announcements because we are well booked up until December, which is very cool. Uh, yeah, <laughs> cool and really surprising because none of the other things I help out with are this booked up. So, uh, all right. So tonight, Theo is going to be reprising his uh, Rust presentation. Uh, he gave it at. Oh, North America Linux Con. Yes. Linux Con? Okay. Um, this was in Toronto last August. Uh, I saw it, it was awesome, and I'm looking forward to seeing it again. Uh, other than that, uh, uh, Bob is going to be doing more uh, VoIP stuff uh, next month. Um, he's going to do f uh, free switch stuff, so that's uh, you know, yet another PBX system. I think it's the, if I remember it correctly, it's kind of the new hotness over. Asterix, and Asterix is the less hotness now. Uh, in September, uh, we've uh, got someone who's going to come and tell us about the Brave browser. Uh, that's going to be a short presentation, so if you've got something else that you would like to present, um, any topic is open, but if it was something that was like web-related, that would be good. If you know someone who's on the Chrome team, which I'm given to understand, at least partially operates out of the Google office here, that would be really cool. So. Um, otherwise, uh, Khaled will be giving us some details on open source astronomy in October, November. Uh, Lori is going to talk about Ceph and speak of the devil, here he comes. So Ceph and uh, large object file storage in open source, uh, he's been making use of that at the University of Waterloo. And in December, Doug, who's in the black t-shirt, um, has recently released a Get, tell me if I get this wrong, like a 3D CAD um, system similar to uh, OpenSCAD, yes. which was presented maybe a year and a half, two years ago, um, and he'll be presenting on that. He will also be, be presenting or has presented a KW Interceptors tomorrow. <laughs> if you are excited about 3D modeling and cannot wait till December, he'll be presenting at KW Intersections, which Mary hosts. Um, their page is on meetup.com and they're at Atomic Labs, yeah. which is just uh, downtown Dataway. So easy to get to. Um, and uh, we haven't posted it yet, but uh, Joe Wainerchuk will be doing a presentation on Kubernetes. He's done uh, doing some work on that, so he'll give us, I think it's going to be like a sort of overview um, what's the deal. And um, after December, we don't have any presentations. So we're desperate for presentations for six months from now. <laughs> oh. I don't have a web-related one, but I can probably, when, when do you need the short one? Uh, September. September? Yeah, I could probably, I could do how to F it up really good in shell, as in like, uh, you know, shell gotchas and their, their solutions. I was thinking about that, probably like 20 to, 40 minutes. I, I could probably do it for hours because I've acted up really good for a long time. But <laughs> as, as with so many of our presenters, keeping it long is not a problem. Yeah, but but uh, but no, I mean you know I, I could probably do a, a you know 20 40 minute one. That that sounds good to me. I don't. We haven't done a shell presentation recently, so I think that would also be a good fit. Does anybody strongly object to a shell presentation? Will you throw down your hat and step out if we schedule a shell presentation? No. Okay. We will take you up on that. Okay. All right. Uh, does anybody have any announcements? All right. Well, uh, oh, Jeff. One quick one. Um, remember, I did the presentation on Let's Encrypt a couple months ago. Mm -hmm. um, it turns out that uh, my hosting provider has, within the last month or so, automatically slipped Let's Encrypt under everything that they're hosting. So all all these little sites that. I've been running there going, golly, I wish I could set up that script on it. All of a sudden, just showed up in my, they, they, they had a post, they had a tweet today that uh, Post Papa was now a sponsor. So I said, ooh, if that's in my cPanel, then yay. And then the next one. So the host, the next is, was, hmm? the host is Host Papa? The, the host Papa .ca. Host Papa .ca. Yeah. They, they, um, I use it for, uh, Couple sites that I'm running, and then my wife's best friend has a couple sites, and all of a sudden, they're SSL. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
so, so that was, if anybody didn't hear it, uh, so Jeff did a presentation a couple months ago on Let's Encrypt and recently found his post, Post Papa, has Let's Encrypt it. Yeah, all the it things. just showed so, up in the last three weeks. The certificates are dated from three weeks ago. So. Nice. <laughs> nice. Always good to see it. Everyone's announced today, so it's just nice. a well, and, and Let's Encrypt actually makes that possible, so. Yeah. Cool. All right, so my last thing is, Paul has a project. He's got the Watt Camp newsletter. Uh, so if you'd like to hear about tech stuff that's happening around here, uh, wattcamp.ca will give you a display of it, and then you can sign up for the newsletter, and it shows up in your mailbox every week. Every week. Beginning of the week, you can find out what's happening. Come on. But the front page of wattcamp.com has not been updated yet, so anybody who actually goes to wattcamp won't know that there's a newsletter. So, um, in the meantime, if you want to be on the newsletter uh, and you're not on it, if you want, you can indicate that on the sign-up sheet, or you can just come up to me and give me your email address and I can subscribe you. I will try to remember to repost that to the mailing list as well. Alright, so that's it. That I've teased Theo enough with uh, making him wait for the mic. Here's Theo. Hello. Theo. Hello. I'm Theo Buller. This is the talk. Uh, it's about both sort of the Rust programming language and how to use it not in usual. So this is useful for kernels and embedded development and all these kind of things. Uh, it starts off with a sort of whirlwind tour of Rust and why you might care about it and then goes into some of the Things I've done with it. Uh, so, yeah. Um, so, why does Rust exist? It's sort of a big question. And it's an important question to answer. It's like, there's a few things they wanted to do with the language. They wanted it to be safe. They wanted it to not have buffer overflows and things like that. That's a number of security problems. And, you know, choose to use it for applications that wouldn't be traditionally written and see so that its safety gets used like, because you're actually using it to confirm uh, for utilities and things. So that, uh, and concurrency is another big feature they want. Um, so that's not going to be talk in this talk. I don't have time for that. But didn't have time for that the first time, so I don't have slides for that at least. Um, so I graduated from Waterloo about a year ago. Uh, people that are from GitHub and everywhere else. Uh, so a bit, a bit of history about us. It was started by Graydon and Moore um, back in 2009. Uh, Mozilla started some funding project and, and working with it. And version 1.0 was finally released in 2015. And that's sort of what it became safe. Before then, especially, there was a lot of shift to try to find what would be the best language. It's very aggressively sort of changing things before it happened. After 1.0, it's been stable. It's been a sort of goal for that. Um, right now, it's up to 1.18, because every sort of six weeks, they kind of release and uh, shift. It has a beta branch, which then if nobody finds any bugs, it's promoted to the release branch, so every six weeks. And every six weeks, there's a new beta attempt against the current lightning. Uh, lightning's kind of interesting because they have unstable features which aren't sort of bug free or like finished working with details on it. You can play with the ground with them as long as you're okay with it possibly going away if they find something else. In uh, stable, they actually have fairly strong stability guarantees. It's not like uh, uh, Swift or something where like, they just increment the major number and you have to fix everything. So they're aiming to be like grass code for 2015, written for 1.0 should just work from now on uh, while they still are releasing new features and things that can be sent to that uh, So there's a bunch of people using it now at this point. The, the biggest uh, user the first user was sort of Mozilla for the server 
replacement in Firefox, which is a parallel render, which they have a few exit talks about the architecture, which is really cool, with very concurrent, going up and down trees in ways that were very difficult to make safe in C++ as they had. But they ended up using Rust on being able to take these aggressive parallelization strategies. <laughs> um, I know Dropbox is working on some things in, in, the, in Rust for the back end. Uh, Skylight, I think, is a, uh, I which one's out. But I think it might be error tracking. Error tracking? Error tracking. I think it's on Rails, but it's a little bit Yeah, boring. it's uh, Rails and the number of people as well. Yeah. I put this a while ago. I forgot. It's a lot of examples. So, programming languages, you traditionally sort of think of them like a, a sliding scale of like more control over everything versus more safety <laughs> and um, correctness guarantees you get. And Rust tries to buck that trend and just try and take it all and be like, I want both control and safety, which is ambitious. I like it. Um, it's sort of a C, it's not uh, actual syntactic language, not far off, like it's really only base C languages. It has Um, uh, a few interesting things, uh, but that's the sort of other world. Here's sort of a small example of so you can take a look at what it's sort of like. Um, which just sets out the first 40 primes. Um, so it's got sort of nice four loops over iterators, which it can have embedded because it's a pretty small demand. Um, if you're going to be mutating a variable or changing it, it requires the mut designator, otherwise things are sort of const by default. Um, <clears throat> it's got sort of a fancy print line macro which has how many specifiers on it. It's, it's nothing hopefully too surprising in this sort of example, but, but as you can sort of see what it looks like. And it's hard to find an example which both fit on a slide and did something slightly non trivial. Yeah. What does for i in 2 dot dot mean? Like for i in the range 2 going upwards, which could be. Yes, so it's got break statements though. Um, so if I say 2 and then dot dot 100, yes. it's not 100. If I yes. don't say anything, it's. Yep. And you can even say. Uh, yeah. It, there's some talk about adding an inclusive range to text. That's going to be an inclusive range, like 1 to 10 will be. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, but not 10, I think. Anyway. And what's the exclamation marks in this? Um, like so, the, the exclamation marks on the print is because print line is a macro and uh, contains checking and compile time for the number of arguments matching, and then we can print all of them, which uh, means it's not sort of an ordinary function and it's specified as such. Same goes for VEC. Yeah, VEC is uh, useful. It's a macro which lets you put any number of arguments in to create a blank vector. Or a vector with those arguments. Uh, Rust does not have var args for uh, normal functions, which they are thinking of trying to find nice ways to add or something, but as a we have the ability to write things like that, like run two, three, four, whatever, uh, to get around that by just having it sort of trying to leave those putting things in there. Uh, so it means they're macro functions which shouldn't make a big difference from using them, but the implication is secondary. Uh, about macros also, you can do 
much more interesting things with them than these, where you can, I don't know, if you're making a uh, like Flask type web app application, you can use these in like, perhaps as a little mini DSL specifying the writing table. You can specify in an app for how to control the syntax of that and make it look nice. Um, so it's a code generation escape hatch to go ahead and sort of create nicer forms than you could otherwise. This is instead of something like the CPD, like the secret like processor or something. So um, it's interesting what they have. They have also in progress some hopes to get compiled in kernels. So you can actually grab a syntax tree out and, and modify it and then return a syntax to your compiler, but they don't want to pin down compilers and terminals in a public API. So that's still a thing. Um, so Rust is a compiled language. It uses LLVM and backend, same as client. Um, a lot of people come and ask me, why is Rust slow? Like, we forgot to pass slash slash release when we're compiling it so that it turns on the code to. Um, Rust, in zero, Rust code is not the fastest. It has a bunch of idioms which held in and not plays out, but you have to ask them all the to actually run there's no optimization passes for this, you know. I mean, it's a common thing on the IRC channel, or on, on things that's been like, how can Rust take 20 seconds to do this, and C takes like 5 or 10 or something? And it's like, it was pass. Press the pass button. Yeah, and then it's fast. It makes it no take longer, but like, it's too Uh, what does safe mean? So I talk about the fast of means. No, no site faults, no dangling pointers. Um, undefined behaviors, uh, not sprinkled around as smoothly as you get to see, but it's quite easy to run an undefined behavior and not realize it. Um, uh, no dangling pointers. Uh, and for the currency part, there's no data races or two. Threads can read and write the same, can write and read that at the same memory location and have non terms behavior on that unless you are explicitly saying, like, this is an unchecked, unsafe area where they explode this. So you can get like the primitives. Uh, so, how Rust achieves a safety relies on one big core idea, which is an ownership idea. Um, you'll see this idea also becoming prevalent in C++ where you have like unique pointer and things. So this is similar to that, but more check at compile time and less <coughs> when you move out of something else that's in some defined state. So the idea is there's exactly one order for each piece of data and uh, the owner is responsible for object cleanup and goes out of scope. So if you allocate a vector, then your function ends and you have to pass the vector out or put it into something else that's no longer. The vector will have its memory free and go out of scope. And this also works for things like uh, if you have a reference counter, you can like it from the drop set of scope and so on. RIAA C++ style descriptors is not part of um, ownership. You can pass it through functional return values or, or parameters and, and variable bindings. Um, so unlike C++, when you move a value, it's not calling some move constructor. It's just sort of a bitwise copy of, like, you give a vector and then, like pointer of like capacity gets copy and the old one is discarded. So uh, this means that a lot more loops can be optimized with like a mem copy template instead of like you have to go through move constructor type of thing. Um, and some types that are basic and don't have any like, things to clean up can be dark copy, which means that you don't invalidate the organization you copy it. Uh, so, 
if I have a function like this, uh, it, it makes a sum of a vector of sort of two bit integers. Um, the vector is being passed in by value. So we, by value means like the struct of pointer passing length is being passed in. Uh, and it's really an integer. I have a total, I loop through, I print it, I return a total. Um, because I pass ownership of the vector in, that means that I'm the owner and I'm not passing anywhere else, so I have to print the vector and the vector is free to this. So if I write main, create a vector, sum it, print a total, if I don't use sum it, if I try to use a vector again, I'll be like, no, we've uh, allowed the vector to be cleaned up, you can't use it again here. Well, with just ownership, that would be the case. But that brings us to the next idea, which is borrowing, where you can a reference or something in. And uh, yeah, just passing ownership in that would become tedious. You don't always want to consume variables. So things like sum, we are only reading it, it would be nice to just say, sum this, and I'm still holding on to it. Um, don't like free it when you're done with it. So here I add the ampersand saying uh, this is a reference to, the, to a vector. Um, and otherwise it goes the same here. Except uh, we're also going to be dereferencing the element as we sort of move over the vector. We're going to uh, reference this to it instead of it's going to be vector. So we have to deal with this at the start. So now you will feel free to use some like multiple times. And when you pass it in, it's more like C than C++ references, where you say, I'm passing in a reference, and you take the understand at the call site to say, I'm handing a reference in. So you can tell when you call a function, is it taking a reference, or is it taking, are you passing a function in? Um, well, if I had a function that, say, is a constructor that creates a new vector on the heap and passes me the thing, I don't want to have a reference. Like, I want the return value being the act of passing ownership to me is nice. I say when you open a file, you want the file system to pass you so that I have ownership of this handle and can go ahead and use it how I want. Go ahead, you are back to 
there's no outstanding references to it, so you can use it. But the line where you say compiler, I am allowed to go ref x plus equals one? Um, if it was a mutable reference, yes. But it's not a mutable reference. So, no. Um, mutable references are specified with ampersand left. And you can have, it has, it has strict sort of alias symbols. You can have only one mutable reference to an object, or you can have as many as you want, uh, immutable references to the object, real only references to the object. Um, and you can also just have the ownership of the object, which lets you move it and things. Whereas if there's extending references, it needs to stay where it is, and you can't um, like reallocate and copy it to somewhere else. If somebody has a pointer into your vector, you can't push or pop the vector to go outside. So, um, if I've got a mutable reference to the vector, I can modify the vector through the reference. I can't modify the vector without going through the reference because there's a mutable reference extended. I can't change it because uh, you're allowed to take some references. So if I have this reference through the reference of B to some interior thing and pushing an element cause it to reallocate, then it would be invalid. It would be bad. But you say fault at that time. So only one legal reference to prevent um, invalidating references. So I can pass in a vector and go ahead and modify the vector as much as I want. Um, and then that sort of works in the expect. You can uh, so when you're passing your own references, you will need to sort of specify if you return your reference, how long does that reference live for? Like I can't sort of return reference to the stack. So it has some syntactic trigger that hides is for simple cases you can probably produce. Like the only thing you can do in a function like this where you perhaps change what X is, but the only integer you can return is in fact what you were passed it. So it's fine. You can go ahead. Um, you can't write something like this where it allocates a little stack for a new integer and then takes a reference to it and returns that. Um, it'll say, like, why does not live long enough? You, you can't sign this. So, the more explicit way to invert that is that there's angle brackets are sort of a for all, or for some lifetime ticket, the reference of lifetime A is passed in, and I'm returning uh, a reference of lifetime A. So, it's just saying the same one that comes in and comes out. This is useful if you've got, say, more than one parameter and you're specifying which parameter your reference is actually sort of tied to. So, um, another thing I'm illustrating with, with this is that Rust has a pretty cool test um, compiler directive where you can label um, functions as tests and so we have to add it to a test suite so that you can just run all your tests nicely. So if I were to go and put these assertions in there to come and fail. So I can just say the cargo test and we'll go and just sort of run all my tests for which is kind of nice. Um, can, you, can you go back from the lifetimes thing? I'm totally missing the sorry. value of lifetimes. It seems like a royal pan pass. What's, what's the... Um, I have a more complicated example which sort of I don't understand the simple example again. Okay. <laughs> um, is a lifetime like a scope? Yes. Okay. So well, what does it mean to define scope A? So it's saying that uh, this scope here is yes. going to be sort of compatible with like scope A, so that when I pass the reference out, I know that I can't 
sort of take this refx and uh, stick it in some variable that lives longer than or result with E is like a parameter. It's like yeah. a scope parameter. So all you're saying is that the thing that I'm going to return from this function should can only this. be used in the same scope in which the thing that I passed into this function was valid, is what you're saying. Yes, where a scope can also be something like it lives as long as the struct does or something. Um, I see. So that you can say, like, I'm narrowing the first parameter's thing, like, instead of having a pointer to a vector, I have a point to the first element. But it can still keep track that, like, you can't keep that reference alive after the vectors were away. Why might I want that, though? That seems like that's just going to um, make my code really hard to maintain, right? Because I don't necessarily know how someone's going to try and use that. So it does follow very sort of straightforward rules as to where the lifetimes apply. The upshot is, is that if it compiles, you know there's not going to be any handling references. So you can go ahead with refactors and things because you know you're not going to sort of miss a case. So it's adding more checking at compile time, which it is fairly common for when you're running routes to spend a while fighting the border checker, that kind of analysis. And until you get used to it, it, it can feel somewhat constricting because you're not used to showing to the compiler like why these pointers are so bad. But once you understand the way it works, I feel it makes it clear to yourself too. Mm -hmm. like, Clearly, this must have been long. I've written some C++ code where I like, end up like, I'm trying to manage the thing, like, oh, I'll get a map to deal with this mapping, and then I have references into map, map the strings still up there, and then I exit the function, and map got cleaned up, and I have lots of things like that. So this would just stop you from being able to do that kind of a thing. Um, in C++, you know, fear iterative validation where as you're looping through a vector, if you change its size by pushing, it can go and reallocate the backing store for the vector, so that when you then try and um, continue to iterate, it will never actually, it'll have a hand which will cause something to happen. Because when you do this line, like, it might only be an array of size 2, which then says, oh, I'll leave no room. I'll get an array of size 4, and then copy everything over, and then free the old one. But it doesn't have a way to tell you that, to tell the iterators to uh, start running into a new array, which will cause it to crash. So it's not, don't mean to pick on C++, but like, this is a thing I've run into before where I've invalidated things. So I was really thinking about sort of the internals of how to work and the point of being validated being accomplished. Um, if you try to do this in REST, it would complain because it's saying that you took a reference to the vector here, and that's a sort of an immutable reference. And while that's in scope, you can't be using the immutable way to change its Side. So this would be rejected by the compiler. The nice friendly thing saying, like, can't be take here because of reference up, up ahead. Up, up ahead. So complicated constraints on lifetimes where I'm saying there are three lifetimes here, and then you sort of can look at the where it say three lifetimes where C is nested in A and C is nested in B. And I'm passing two references and I'm returning a, a new reference. And I, the only thing I'm telling is that the new reference must live at least as long, long as both references. Okay? Once it, either of these references will go away, the, you can't use the return. 
So it's sort of just looking at both and picking one or two to return. And as soon as the uh, that that max one example is that the simplest way that you can write that function? Um, With the same functionality. I don't. There might be a way to inline the constraint bounds into the. Uh, Clause here to avoid the weird clause, but I'm not 100% sure. I guess I'm thinking maybe type in here for some reason. Um, because that's very, very explicit. Yes. I'm not sure if this compiles with lifetime elite. Like, I might not need to assign any of times at all. I'm not sure. Okay. Um, and why I was just doing it very explicit here so that I can talk about it. Yeah, I, that, I, that makes sense to me, yeah. I, I'm not sure if I should try this example with it. That's fine. Okay. Um, How come there are no semicolons in the top part of the if? Um, Rust uh, uses semicolons in an interesting way. Um, when you have a semicolon, you are saying, I'm not using a return value of whatever is on that line. If you have a one-line function, you uh, this is sort of like uh, returns like five. You can say five, and so they return five semicolons. So here I'm saying the result of the if is just being passed right out as a return value. So I'm not putting any semicolons. Okay. There is a return statement though, isn't there? Yes. Yeah. So you could write that. As C, you can write that in C style. Yeah, you can, you can also put like return yeah. x and you call return, return x. Okay. 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 But that's a functional style of programming, which yeah. is something that I'm, like, I'm personally used to. I mean, so it just made it kind of a slide better, so. Yeah. yeah. Why do lifetimes a, b, and c end where you say they are? Because x and y are still valid. Is it because the, you've taken a reference to x and y when you passed in the max mu? Yeah, so I'm talking to the references A and B are on this. The reference the 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 is that X. I can even okay. I can even pull these two up into two more of that statements right. to make that more clear, but that doesn't turn the same. So it's not when X and Y went under scope, no. it's when the references to X and Y went under scope. Yes, exactly. Okay. Um, so you can hand out references because you, you will be you know that the reference that you're returning here, bigger, is gone at this point. So you know that you don't need to have A or B around anymore. So you go ahead and you can go ahead and modify these or anything. There's nothing extending to them. You can go ahead and move them wherever you want. Um, Rust also has some nice convenience things for structures. Um, here's how you define a two-dimensional vector. Um, unlike C, it's got the type afterwards. It's or something like two, four, or five, five, or something. Um, uh, use of the back is in the, the normal way with, with, with dots. Um, even with sort of a reference to something, you can still just use dot in like arrows, which is always the thing that I'm refactoring to see if I have to change all my arrows to dots and vice versa. Um, but, it also has struct level of creation with, with field changes, so it's fairly readable as well. Um, in addition to sort of having freestanding functions that take in references, you can um, create methods for, for structs. So you say, I'm implementing things for vector, and one of the things I'm implementing is magnitude, and then like Python I'm taking sort of an explicit self parameter, and then Using it. So now I can call this uh, sort of p.magnitude. And these are just sort of pretty nice for me phasing your functions, and I find it makes I'm happy that these are available. Um, can I uh, define the structure of X2D in one library and nipple, that nipple function in another library? Um, or is there so, kind of there is 
coherence rules saying um, that I think the same crate, the problem compilation unit is called crate, has to um, input the things for like this. Um, there is a way to do your thinking, which I will explain once I've explained whether the component needed to do that. Okay. I'll get back to your question later. So, traits are another nice thing about <coughs> this. Um, there's sort of a bundle of methods under one name that you can implement, and there's sort of interfaces or type classes, or whatever you want to call them. Um, so, I can define like a trait metric space, which has a magnitude, and now I'm going to input the metric space for my 2D back 2D, and then uh, as I was. And I could also use like polar coordinates for the 2D point and implement magnitude for that. And now I can go ahead and say for some metric space V. I want to print out the name of it. I got to reference it, this will, at compile time, I could uh, instantiate V with either like the vector 2D or the polar coordinate. And uh, pick one at compile time to use. Um, this is sort of matching the static dispatch of your classes where you know which class you're calling C++ or templates, similar to the where at compile time it will just be it will create sort of two sets of code assembly for the different size printer functions and then call one or the other based on uh, which line of code it's on, so those types. You can also go ahead and uh, create sort of Trait objects, as they're called, where they have dynamic dispatch on them. So I can have a vector of metric space pointers, which will have a pointer to the action data and a pointer to the uh, V table, the virtual table of all methods for it. And then I can loop over that and call for anything in non vector space or metric space, give me a size. So in the previous example, mm -hmm. the, the print table. Yeah. So it's implicitly passing a V table. It's not even passing a V table, it's compiling. Is it it's inline, it's inline expanding the, the function column? It's not exactly inline, it will have uh, just. Well, in the body of size it has to know yeah. which, which uh, function to use. Yeah, and it'll, it'll create two versions of the from path for the size vector. Yeah, so make two copies of the function. Yeah, one for specialized language. Okay, so if it's a so you can like, go to the from having. There are, like, yes, in the same way that you use a bunch of templates and people's dots, you might have a bunch of templates. It is, yeah. but it has much more sort of error messages and things, and you, can, you can't pass something that isn't a metric space. It's nicer. But yeah, it's similar to template in terms of like the code is generated is, yeah. and you also have to include it into the header or anything like that. There's no headers. Yeah. So it has learned from C++. So in the, in the second, is the next step yeah. then. So then you have. This isn't like a virtual method call, and you'll get the same sort yeah. of performance as a virtual. The, the actual bits that get passed in is the. Or it's like a double pointer. It's a double pointer. Yeah. So Russ just to list them with this object objects instead of um, having to be hit on the first thing in the, in the well then you can have process same data that can be expressed from the viewpoint of multiple different traits. Exactly. And and Russ is going for inheritance and all for data. Yeah. So it doesn't need to sort of have a slicing. But you could do you could do an inheritance on traits. Oh uh, yes, you can say this is a, if you would in order to put this in face, first you must implement the hybrid traits. Right. 
which just means that if you have a but the inheritance is baked into the data, it's baked into the tree, yeah. which yeah. is a separate object. So the prerequisite to yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So this is this sort of, it both has static dispatch and dynamic dispatch. Now to ask, answer your question about if you want to implement methods on a data type that you didn't, you didn't uh, do, you can create a new trait yes. and input the trait for that object, and then somebody who wants to use your methods will simply import that trait into the script, and then they'll be So, because either you have to be the one who to find a data type to, to, to implement a trait, or you have to be the one to find a trait and you can implement it for any data type. This way, two different libraries can't have conflicting implementations. I was wondering about that. Yeah. So that's, I think, a Haskell writer too. Like, Coherence and this is something that like you have to either be the owner, or the definer of the struct or of the um, trait. Trait. Yes. Okay. Is this a solution? Um, Did I not? Oh, okay. Changes right now. So, um, how are we going for time?